Okay. So, so my hope is that we, this won't take more than 15 minutes. Okay. So I'm just trying to now connect uh, this development that we discussed in Regi theory for uh, scattering in quantum field theory. There is a very uh, similar techniques that you can apply in conformal uh, field theory and uh, essentially it will, we will derive this, the same two types of Regi results. One is that you organize particles into trajectories, so here we will organize operators into Regi trajectories so, and, uh, and also the other uh, result is the high energy limit of a scattering amplitude. Here we will also relate these Regi trajectories with the Regi limit of a four-point function. Okay? So, so let's see how that works in practice. So, so the first obstacle is just which observable to look at. So there's no scattering amplitudes in conformal field theory. So we need to look at um, a different observable. And we're going to look at uh, a four-point function. So I'll try to use notation similar to what uh, David was using in his lectures. So we're going to look at this four-point function. And I'm going to put the points exactly with the same causal relations that David explained. So I'll put here 1, 3, 2, and 4. Okay, It's time-ordered correlator. <coughs> and now the question is, um, what is the right kinematical limit of this four-point function that corresponds that we should call the Regi limit, okay? That would be the analog of high energy scattering for uh, a scattering process in uh, massive quantum field theory. And, uh, and the idea is very simple. You just, uh, if you have a scattering process and you're going to go to the high energies, what you should do is you just boost one particle in one direction and the other in the other direction, and that increases the center of mass energy, but does not increase the momentum transfer, okay? Keeps the momentum transfer fixed. Okay. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to boost this particle one and this final particle two with the same boost, so the momentum transfer is fixed, but um, this two is boosted with the opposite boost, so we increase the center of mass energy in this channel, okay? So let me just write an equation for that. So let's let's, um, well, let me say zero here, zero transverse coordinates. I'll bring all points to this two-dimensional uh, plane. And then uh, the, the statement I was making in equation is just that in this null coordinates, I'll just boost So, so this is the boost that I will do for particles 1 and 2. And for particles, sorry, yes, 1 and 2. For particles 3 and 4, I'll do the opposite boost. So, so this was one boost and the other sorry, minus plus, OK? So the, so the Regi limit corresponds to taking this boost very large. That's, that's what uh, is the natural definition of the Regi limit for a low, for a four-point function of local operators. Okay, and now, fortunately, uh, David explained this very well, how to relate, what does this limit correspond in terms of cross ratios of the four-point function, okay? So let me, let me write that here. So I define this to be the usual factor x12 square x34 square to the delta phi times a function of the cross ratios okay and um, well maybe I'll do it here so so the first thing is uh, that you have to remember is that if you start from from the Euclidean regime A of Z, Z bar with Z and Z bar complex conjugate, 
uh, and you want to go to this uh, Lorentzian regime with this uh, uh, causal relations, you, you, what, what you're supposed to do is to do what David denoted by this continuation, um, where this just means that uh, you keep z fixed, so you have the point zero, the point one, and you start, let's say you start um, with z and z bar complex conjugate, and then you just go around the branch point at one with z bar, and then the regular limit actually corresponds to taking both points to zero. Okay, so, so the regular limit, that you can just, if you just take those definition of the points, you compute the cross ratios and take the limit of large lambda, you'll see that both z and z bar go to zero and the ratio is fixed. Okay, so the, the regular limit is exactly like the standard Euclidean OP limit but on the second sheet, you, you just have to go around this branch point. Okay? If there was not this sign, this would just be the standard OP limit. Okay? Okay, good. So, so that's the first part. So instead of a scattering amplitude, we have this correlator, and instead of taking large S and fixed T, we take small z bar with fixed ratio, okay? That's, that's the uh, direct analogy, in, in position space at least. So all of this can also be reformulated in Mellin space, and there the analogy is even closer because, well, you can even call the variables S and T, but, um, but let's, let's not do that. So, so then the idea now, is to, uh, it's basically the same thing, doing sommerfeld watson transform. So the first step, we expand this function in partial waves, which is conformal field theory, are just conformal blocks. So we start from this, well, this won't work, but let's, let's just write it to start. So we have an expansion in conformal blocks of z v bar. And uh, if now you do this continuation, so notice this expansion is the expa I'm, I'm expanding around using the OPE one, two, okay? When <coughs> Z and Z bar goes to zero. So if you do this continuation, well, the first problem is that you go outside the radius of convergence of this. But another way to see that, which is more directly like what I was showing in the, in the scattering case, is that if you take this function and you take the regular limit, this function goes like, z z bar to 1 minus j over 2 times some, some other function of the ratio, z over z bar, okay? So this is in the, in the regular limit. So you see it's exactly like in flat space, we had this Legendre polynomial that was going like s to the j, so if you want to know the limit, higher and higher spin will just be dominate, so this sum is basically useless to answer that question. It's the same here. The higher spins become more singular, okay? It's really very clear analogy. So, sorry, this function, of course, depends on delta. So, so the first trick is to, I mean, in, in scattering, what we did was to transform the sum over spin into an integral, and then deform the counter, right? That was the sommerfeld watson trick. So here, we would have to make this an analytic function of spin, but well, if you just have sum over delta, this will never work, right? So you, <laughs> because there is no way in which for you can have a sum over delta and an integral over spin. So the only way that this will work is when we actually put integral on both delta and, and spin, right? There's no natural way to continue just the spin. So, so that's the first, uh, the first step is, so instead of writing that, well, I'll write it here, we will use this uh, expansion in, in conformal partial waves where you have this integral over the principal series. 
Okay, so we, we start from this different representation. And I'll just call this function f of delta j, so it, it includes the Plancharel measure and the c delta j, okay, I'll just pack everything together for simplicity of the notation. Okay, and so this is now the conformal partial wave, which basically is conformal block plus its shadow. Okay, so we are a bit better now, but um, so, so this function, you can also take the regi limit and it has a similar behavior because it's just block plus shadow. It still diverges with a spin and uh, um, there's some other function here which usually we call omega of z over z bar. Yes. Okay, to infinity. No, here, here j and delta are fixed. Uh, this limit is in zz bar. Zz bar to zero in the second sheet. Okay. It's just, this is just a, yeah, limit just in zz bar. Delta and j are both fixed here. Not taking a No, I'm not here, I'm... Well, you, you pointed at that and you said it's not uh, between maps. Yes, I mean, any fixed j that is bigger than one, this will diverge in the regi limit, and the higher the j, the stronger will the divergence be. Okay? But, but not large j, I mean, any fixed j. <laughs> okay, so here we are uh, a bit better but not much better because still we have this divergence, but now we already have a function which is analytic in J, so we know what to transform this integral into, this sum into an integral, okay? So I'll just again write, well, this is the third time we do summer Feldbotten transform, so. Sorry, maybe it's lack of my imagination, but you, here you have some set of operators labeled by... Is the position of bounding delta j directly a result of that operator j? Yes. And uh, what I'm asking is that this f delta j is only contained in this particular set all the way up. Ah, you're saying, I guess you're saying is that, is there a way to replace this over a sum over regi trajectories? And here I would put like some OP coefficient that depends analytically on J, and then I'll sum over J over each regi trajectory, something like that. But I would have to have a sum over regi trajectories, and then for each regi trajectory I could have, yeah, if I could, if I knew how to organize it like that, maybe I could do it term by term. But uh, yeah, doesn't, it's not, it's not at all obvious that one can do that. I guess that's what you are suggesting. It's, it's, yeah, but it's not even clear. Well, from the answer we get here, it's kind of clear that this is not the right way to do it, right? Because, because it's not like, if you do for each regi trajectory, the limit, the regi limit will be different from the full four point function. So, so really you have to do everything at the same time. Sorry. So why can't you write both the delta and the j sum at the integrals at the same time? Why do you need to do it? Yeah, that's... You need to write both the delta and the j's? Well, this is the formula that uh, David showed how to derive from harmonic analysis. 
So now I'm going to transform this sum into an integral just doing the Sommerfeld-Watson trick. But the integral has to have Yeah, perha perhaps what you're saying is that there, perhaps there is a directly harmonic analysis in Lorentzian signature where you can immediately fall on some double integral in J and delta. Maybe, maybe that's possible. I, yeah, it's, I don't know how to do it, but maybe it's possible, yeah. It's, uh, Sorry, uh, I mean here Z minus one, sorry. So, so again here I'm using the simplicity that I took the <coughs> So here there's only even spins because I took the same operator for simplicity, so I'm Otherwise, I would have to write a, an, a, another term. So this, this is the continuation of the, I mean, this is the, the even spin analytic function that continues the even spin uh, uh, OP coefficient. And so this combination has zeros on the odd spin, so I don't get this contribution from, um, from, the, from those terms. So let, uh, let me just here. Remind you, so in the L-plane is usual story. You have this, uh, now I only want to have poles in the even spins because of that, and so I took this combination. This is a, a symmetry, sorry, I am not saying it, it's minus one to the L, minus one to the J, psi of ZZ bar. So that's why, that's why it does that. Sorry? Yes, okay, let's, let's do this more carefully. Strictly speaking, I should first do these manipulations on the first sheet and then continue after I, I deform. Otherwise, I'll just go out to the radius of convergence. So let's, let's first stay here. So, so this is the original contour here. And... Um, and now we do the same trick again. Well, I, here I'm, I'm simplifying a little bit, but we can discuss. So, let's see. so now we assume that uh, there are some poles and there could also be some cuts, okay? So what we're gonna do is what we did before. We just integrate like that. And then we have some, possibly some integral like that. Well, we don't know for, for spin uh, less than two, we really don't know the full analytic structure, ah, okay. right, of, uh, of this function. We don't know what can appear on this side. In fact, let me see if I can plot, if I can draw this. Something like that can appear, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so what do I want to say here? So, so now is the usual story. That is, 
the contour at infinity to worry, and that's, that's part of the details that I'm not going to describe. So here, I'm basically following the argument like uh, Cornalba presented in, in 2007 in his paper. But there, and then in our work also in Mellin space, we actually never really, we, we just dropped the term at infinity by assumption. We had no control over the behavior of this integral at infinity. We just assumed that it would work and we checked the consequences of that. But uh, in, the, in the last paper on light ray operators by David and Peter, they actually analyzed carefully how the, so these functions we know, they are just a conformal block plus shadow, and this function we know from the inversion formula, from the Lorentzian inversion formula, so you can analyze the behavior of both functions at large j, and okay, you can show that you can drop this contour there is a subtlety here that I'm skipping, but okay, you have to separate these functions a bit better than what I'm doing to be able to say that, but it's not important for the, the moral of the story at the moment. And then, there is this question which you don't know what happens here. So what I will do, I will just write the simplest thing, which is assume that the singularity, the, the first singularity with biggest real part is just a pole. Okay. If not, okay, it will be a cut. We, we don't know that. So in that case, this integral, well, I'll first let me write an equal sign. So there is this contour uh, uh, C2, let's say. Actually, there's here the natural position to put the contour. In general, it's um, 1 minus D over 2 for generic uh, dimension. It's what plays the role of minus a half. Okay, there's this integral. And then I will just write the contribution from the pole. So, so that will just be this integral over delta just comes along for the right, stays exactly the same. And then you'll just take the residue of f of delta uh, j when j is equal to, let's say, j of delta. Okay? Let's say this pool is at the position j of delta. Okay? We do this for fixed delta. And here we just have this psi function. Well, I can just write psi plus psi. And now, at this moment, we can, it is safe to take this continuation and to take the Reggie limit because now all the, the real part of uh, the spin that appear in these partial waves is bounded, right? So now we can just take the, um, the limit term by term, and if it's, uh, if it's uh, dominated by a regipole, the final answer is just this integral, the delta over 2 pi i, and then you get this behavior of the partial waves, 1 minus j of delta over 2 times this uh, function of the ratio. This function is also kinematical. And then some other function which comes from the residue. Okay, so if you want dynamics in the residue limit is encoded in these two functions. This is the dynamical information. And then this function is just some kinematical function that comes from the limit of conformal blocks or conformal partial waves. What is the argument to drop the contour at infinity here? This, this contour here at infinity? Yeah. This, is, this, is what, uh, this is what I was saying that it's explained in detail in David's and Peter's. Uh, so, but you see, we have all the ingredients now. It's, it's, it's a bit non-trivial, we have to do it carefully, but this is conformal blocks. Okay, so, so we, we know, I mean, at least in, we know sufficiently explicit to answer this question, at least in, so let's say, four dimensions, we even have hypergeometric functions, so we can just check. And here, we can check from the Lorentzian formula, from the inversion formula.
actually find that. But f is found. You, you said you, you get f from the word that you're looking for. But I mean, it doesn't matter how you get it. That is, my claim is as long as you know there is a continuation, that is this representation, where this function does not grow exponentially when t you take j to, to be large, then you can play this game. Okay? My, the question is how do you show that that function exists and then you can use the Lorentzian inversion formula because there it's explicit and you can check if that statement is true. Not sure if, do you want to add something to? So that's the main new ingredient then in this construct. Yeah, so, so before the Lorentz inversion formula, we would do these manipulations and just say, okay, let's try. Let's drop the contour at infinity and see what happens because we get the Reggie pool. I mean, right, you can do everything just saying, let's assume it drops out. And then we matched with perturbative calculations in n equals four and all that, and it was working. Now, there was a conceptual breakthrough that now we can actually check that it works. Okay? But can you use this Lorentz inversion formula to find the position of the poles? No, that doesn't change. It's the same thing. So I will explain you now. It's, it's, it's a pole of this function, but poles of these functions, we already knew that are just related to the spectrum. So this is just, uh, I mean, this is what I'm going to... Let me, let me, this is, yeah, this is, I'm assuming that there's one dominant, right? If there is another pole here, it will, of course, you have to take into account, but that's subdominant, yeah. I'm just saying the, the leading term. It's also an interesting question to know if actually, if you can really do the equality, where you just sum over the poles and, real, and, and if you can make sense of that, uh, Convexity, it can, yeah, the first one. So, but let me, let me, I'll draw, I'll draw that picture now, so it will become. It's basically the convexity you proved. It's the same convexity. The only, the only thing that you have to add is that it's not just convexity on the integers, it's of the full analytic continuation, but it's the same convexity, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. So, so, but just, uh, just to explain that, so we, we had this function, it was analytic in both uh, parameters, and we already know from matching with OPE that this function has poles in delta in the spectrum, right? So whenever you have an operator in the spectrum, this function has poles. Uh, how should I write it? I already used delta. Delta, delta physical, let's say, of, uh, and for each spin, okay? So for each spin, it will have poles uh, uh, on the physical <coughs> operators of that spin. So, but now you can just think of this function as a function of j, and that's what, uh, that's what uh, j of delta is. It's just the inverse function of the spectrum as a function of the spin. So. Another way, perhaps more clear, is to just to draw the plot. So this is the, the uh, analog of the two Frauchi plot. So I plot spin versus the dimension. And, um, and now let me plot here some operators. So let's see, let's say this. Okay, so for example, here I have the stress tensor. And then 
in this diagonal is the unitary bond. And so at spin four, the operator has to have some dimension a bit bigger than the unitary bound and spin six something, and spin eight. And now the statement is that you can draw a curve through this. And this curve is just a curve defined by whatever, one over F delta J equals zero. Right? It's just this position of this pool. And because F is shadow symmetric, this curve is shadow symmetric. So this, this should have a, a reflection symmetry along this axis. Okay. So I guess, does this answer your question, Slava? So if these poles that we know to match the OPE are just the same poles, just interpreting the new variable. We don't, it's true. This curve here could actually go there. But for this, for the leading trajectory, so for the trajectory, so there will be other operators here, right? There are other operators of spin two and of spin four. Uh, so there will be subleading trajectories, okay? So for the first trajectory, we can use directly the Lorentzian inversion formula and because this one is like the first, uh, is, the, is the limit of the radius of convergence. So it's the first uh, divergence of the integral. We can calculate this for any complex spin or if you want for every real spin. And we can actually show that it's convex even in, in the middle, not just in the integer. So, so we know that it cannot do that. So, so that's the statement. And then because of, so for the leading one, we prove convexity. Moreover, there is symmetry. So it's clear that the minimum, so, so now you have to see that actually we are integrating here, right? We are integrating, this is the principal series axis, right? It's, this is real delta and that's imaginary delta. So we are integrating like that, but that is, um, this is an analytic function, so this is just a saddle point. So in this direction, it's actually a maximum, the, the spin at the origin. So, so you conclude that the strict limit, the strict regi limit is ZZ bar to the one minus j of zero over two, okay? Because you still had this integral to do over the principal series, but the maximum value of this exponent is at the origin, and so the intercept dominates the full amplitude. Here you're taking big j of z over two. Yes. Yeah, this is changing notation, yeah, it's true. In this notation, thanks. This is when z, z bar go to zero with fixed ratio. I mean, that, that, is, that is here a function of the ratio which I'm not writing. And from this integral, strictly speaking, you have to do this integral by saddle point, so you get some extra log behavior on top of that, but it's a small, small correction. I mean, this is, a, this is a analytic function, right? So the derivative is zero here, and the, the, the second derivative is positive here, so it, it's a saddle point, right? Analytic functions don't have maxima or minima. Okay, do I have to say, do I want to say something else? Ah, last point that just I want to comment briefly is that uh, that tells us immediately a uh, bound on this intercept because we know that the function actually cannot grow in this limit. Okay, so that... <laughs> it was like two pages, my God. Okay, 
So, so I'll just state it then. I, I can explain if you want, but I, I think it's not very important. So, so the one three OPE, okay, the OPE around uh, the one three OPE still converges, and uh, and you can use it to go all the way to this limit, and it implies that actually this uh, this function in the Regi limit is bounded by the function in the Euclidean regime, okay? Basically because in the Euclidean regime, this is a sum of ZZ bar with some positive coefficients, okay? And then the continuation introduces some phases, so it can only decrease it, okay? So this, this we know from this OPE that is convergent, but this, okay, this just goes to one, right? Because this is just a standard OPE limit is dominated by the identity okay? when ZZ bar goes to zero. So we know, well, I guess I could put an equal there. We know that uh, this intercept, I guess in my notation, j of d over 2, cannot be bigger than 1, okay? Which is exactly the analog we got um, from the Frasser bound. Okay, and... Uh, and we can make, again, the same uh, conjecture, like the nuclear democracy, that all operators lie on red trajectories. And not sure exactly how much that buys us in practice, but I think this is the, uh, the main picture. I mean, then all of this has nice interpretations holographically in ADS, but I think in pure CFT language, these are the main, uh, main points in this uh, topic. I mean, feel free to add more if you think of it. Yes? So I, I would like to add a comment. So it seems to me that it can potentially buy us a huge amount of information because instead of working with individual operators in a numerical bootstrap, which is like working with a phone book, you can think in terms of these functions and parameterize everything which you do in terms of functions, which potentially is like a much more manageable yeah, it's, I mean, I mean, that's, for example, you could just use this representation of the block, right, where here you already have a nice function and you have this integral over the principal series. But, but we know that the difficult here is to impose unitarity because this function is being integrated along the principal series, but unitarity tells you that the residues of the poles which are far away from the contour are positive. So it's not that easy to numerically bootstrap using that type of functions. But may I mean, maybe. I think that's part of the idea of the half a space when Balt was working in this direction. And maybe it can work. Yes. Yes. But when you think about this in terms of uh, the function of delta J, and you think about it as strong Higgs coupling because you know, it's two to the J plus one, what happens to this function when it goes to it? Would you have any opinion as to this function when it goes to Sanders? Like no, that's, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know what happens. So perhaps I can say some words to explain the question to, to the rest. So, so in n equals four, uh, if you work in the planar limit, so if you take super young mills and you work uh, in the planar limit, number of colors to infinity, then uh, we really know this function extremely well, okay? We can do perturbation theory, but now I think the, the state of the art is uh, Kolev, Gromov, and collaborators from integrability they, I mean, they can compute the spectrum and they can compute directly this function with uh, 10 loops or even more non-perturbatively, numerically, okay? So, and we know that in this, uh, in this um, limit, this leading gradient trajectory, so first of all, all of these operators are uh, 
in the, in the planar limit, these operators are single trace operators. And uh, as, as many of you know, like the, the dimension of these single trace operators, well, what I was calling delta physical of J, grows like log J at large J, okay? So this trajectory, uh, this gap here becomes very large. And in fact, I'm not sure if I can draw in the same picture. We, we can do that, analyze that at any value of the tooth coupling. Okay, so in this limit, we still have the tooth coupling. And so we can plot this curve at any value of the tooth coupling. And at, at small tooth coupling, I guess I won't draw the curve. It's a bit too complicated. So at lambda equals zero, you have that this intercept value is given by one and then starts to go up. And at lambda equals infinity, this intercept value is given by two, okay? And when you go to weak to strong coupling in the planar limit, you go like that. And this two is precisely the spin of the graviton in, uh, in the dual theory. Okay, so uh, as Peter said, so this doesn't contradict this story here because it's not the full correlator. This is just, uh, so what we are saying is that this correlator, A of ZZ bar, um, well, if you write the full correlator, including the disconnected part, you'll have a one, and then you'll have this correction, which is small one over n square, and then it's growing, like I'm saying, this ZZ bar to the one minus this intercept, okay? And so this can grow as long as it's not bigger than n square. It doesn't contradict this theorem. It's the order of limits that matters. But at some point, if n is finite, this growth must stop. So the question is, how do trajectories reorganize such that this infinite end picture where we have this leading trajectory that has intercept bigger than one actually transforms at finite end to a trajectory that has intercept less than one? I guess that's the question. So, I mean, another indication that something uh, must change is that in the exact theory, this is not the leading Reggie trajectory because there are double trace operators which here have, right, there's some double trace operators, maybe some other color, which are here because the, their anomalous dimension does not grow like log j. It's some fixed number at, uh, at large spin. This would be double trace, I think that's right, double trace operators. So actually at finite end, the leading trajectory must be something like that. And then these two trajectories, which cross at infinite end, because one is single trace, the other is larger, they must somehow uh, repel each other. And perhaps that phenomena somehow changes here the behavior. But I don't know how to draw this picture. That's, that's, uh, that's my reply. I, at least I, I hope I made the question clear. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. 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 Could be. There are. Can you repeat the question? So, this is uh, related actually to this trivial toy example that I showed this morning. So, perhaps if you solve this equation, you see several trajectories, but now if you analytic continue here in delta, these trajectories actually merge in branch points and they are just different sheets of the same multi sheeted function. Okay? And. Um, and I think in this planar limit, there's actually some evidence from that, for that, that uh, this trajectory that I'm plotting here, very nice and smooth, has branch points at finite tooth coupling when you go outside the, the, um, the real delta yeah, axis. Like 
Again, I'm not sure exactly what does that mean. Ah, they no, cannot cross here in the for real delta. I think that's really just a generic statement that it requires some kind, right? This levels of some Hamiltonian that if if they cross, there should be some symmetry to avoid them for mixing, right? Any mixing would create level crossing. I I I don't know of any stronger. Uh, argument than that. Just a clarification for the, the dimension going like log j yes. happens when j is bigger than log square <coughs> half? When it's the biggest parameter here. So here there will be the, some function of lambda it's usually called is the cusp anomalous dimension and then uh, well sorry plus j sorry of course there's j that's the unitarity bound but that's the anomalous dimension. On top of that, so, so. J is even big at the end, or J is no, no, no. This is n is the biggest, so we're doing planar. Everything is planar, and then we take large J. Yeah, no, n is the bigger, biggest parameter. I think everything is planar here. If it's non-planar, we don't know almost anything. <laughs> yeah. Fifty minutes. 51, maybe I just permuted. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much.